at the last moment it occurred to me that some sort of introduction might be expected, especially for those of you who have never known Aurelio. And uh, I'm going to speak to you of Pache, who was born a little more than a century ago, 1908 it was, in Chiure, so you know, where he studied economics at the university. He got a doctorate in 1930, spent a year at the Sorbonne. He was at the beginning of his sort of ambles around the world. Uh, uh, really uh, avid for sort of information, but others. His knowledge of other languages brought him to Fiat, where a successful industrial mission in China in 1935 won him a position in Fiat's management. During World War II, he became involved in the anti fascist movement and in the resistance, where his work with the anti fascist underground caught up with him in 1934 when he was arrested and imprisoned for a year. After the war, he began a most distinguished career in industry, conservation, and international affairs. He was engaged in rebuilding Fiat, and indeed Italy, and had a hand in the founding of Alitalia, and uh, the airline, I guess. In 1958, with the backing of Fiat, he founded Ital Consult, which was a consulting, international consulting for Italy. He had become president of Olivetti in 1964, which was then facing a significant difficulty. <laughs> With his foresight and entrepreneurial vision, he turned Olivetti around. He threw himself into other organizations as well, including Adela, I think, an international consortium of bankers, surprised me rather, than, aimed at supporting industrialization in Latin America, when he wrote a most celebrated paper that impressed many people, including Alex King, then Director General for Scientific Affairs for the OECD in Paris. Pichet and King collaborated very successfully through 1968, deciding they had to do something to encourage longer range, range thinking among Western European governments. Uh, he then persuaded the Agnelli Foundation to fund a two-day brainstorming meeting of European economists and scientists at the Académie des Lincei, or how you better put it, I suppose, in Rome in early April 1968 to discuss the ideas of Pache and King on the globality of problems facing mankind and, the, and of the necessity of acting at the global level. After a following meeting at Pache's home, the Club of, Ray, of Rome was formed and there three major concepts were defined for its thinking. A global perspective, long-range thinking, and the cluster of intertwined problems they called the global problematique, or the predicament of mankind, which I think was almost the same. They thought that it is not impossible to foster a human revolution capable of changing our present course. At the same time, an MIT study headed by Jay Forrester began on the implications of growth on population increase, agricultural production, non-renewable resource depletion, industrial output, and pollution generation. The results of the study were published in The Limits to Growth, 1972. The adventure of the spirit had started. So, and, uh, <coughs> <coughs> then there started, I think, the most prominent and successful part of his career. His writings, perhaps, especially in the human quality, was the summit of his authorship, I call it. I spoke about that a few years back in this building. I do not want to speak of this period now, though, but rather go beyond it to his last book, because it is too late, because it is too late, of 19, before it's not, it is too late, uh, in 1984 before it is too late. He not only wrote it with another person, Daisaku Ikeda of Japan, who since 1975 had been president of one of the largest Buddhist lay organizations in the world, the goal of which, the goals of which were reportedly the promotion of education, the fostering of international cultural exchange, and the establishment of a lasting world peace. Aurelio and Ikeda shared not only the writing, but I'm sure the planning of that work, really, the accomplishment of it. After writing The Human Quality, Aurelio 
used in his introduction to it. That he should continue his work as an industrial executive only if he could explore what other comprehensive ends he could serve. He wrote, and I quote, I shifted def definitely my main base to Rome, making ready for a new phase in my life. Psychologically, I had moved almost full circle, returning to some of the ideals and hopes of my youth. The way he stepped out of being this terribly successful sort of uh, international executive and so on, and said a thing like this, and he had to want to pull back from all of this. And uh, I will not speak it before it is too late, uh, it's a vision. So I could do that if uh, that is acceptable. Could you speak loudly? Yes, it's not loud enough. Just not loud. <coughs> no, I thought it would be loud enough. Okay. Some of us are. Yeah. All right, I'll yell. It was too painful then. <laughs> I tried to speak louder. Please don't yell. <laughs> I, I thought I was the only one to say that other people don't speak loud enough. <laughs> well, this is before, before it is too late. Now, here. This is, I go into Aurelio Pache and Daisaku Ikeda and what they wrote, and this is what they wrote here. This is the last of his books. And uh, it was the last, and I think very interesting, and I would think very little read. And he starts off by, by being, you know, they start off by saying what they mean. The catastrophe of war is the most destructive and wasteful of all human activities. Bang, bang, this is what The most reliable basis for peace is to strengthen bonds of mutual trust and understanding among all peoples. Mutual trust and understanding. Above all, attitude demands revision. The United Nations is the only place in which cooperative deliberation in the name of peace is possible, but member nations must abandon, abandon egotism and work together in self-sacrificing devotion to the cause of peace. In other words, they haven't been doing that. And uh, uh, can they possibly change their attitudes and so on? He's asking for a lot. He's going beyond what uh, politicians ask for. A global government mm -hmm. must be federalist and not totalitarian. And uh, from what I can see, federalist means, you know, when there were component nations are to be independent, independent in internal affairs. In other words, they can't all just be bossed around from the outside. Uh, disarmament is not peace. Peace is a cultural state of soul or mind. The cultural state of soul or mind. The whole community must treasure it. War arises from the arrogance of power. The military, political, scientific, warmongering complex must be eradicated. That's Peche talking. Akeda, the Buddhist, teaches that the three spiritual defilements, this is again, it's the, the Buddhist report, three spiritual defilements, greed, anger, folly, are the causes of the three calamities. War, pestilence, famine. Again, this is a whopper of a statement. Eliminating them requires wisdom and compassion. Peace is, a, as said before, is a cultural state of soul and mind. Ethics and morality are valuable, but haven't delved into the vast power deep within us. They're all very well, ethics and morality. Yeah. We talk about it, and a lot of us are mm -hmm. ethical and moral, but it hasn't delved deeply enough within us. A profound inner revolution is required. And this, of course, carries right through this book. But an inner revolution is what both of these men are after. Now, the, in the, it is Ikeda that takes the lead in this first bit in this book on the human revolution. 
Man has altered the environment to seek hum suit human needs. His science and technology overcome nature, and his legal and social systems have been improved to secure long-term happiness. Yeah. Pessimism, however, is now growing, and specialization courts disaster. People are specializing in this or that, and so on and so on, but they still turn, haven't got the total point and haven't been quite entirely internalized, as, as I see. And uh, yeah, okay. Pessimism is now growing? Yes. The outer is all right, but inner spiritual life is neglected. Outside, yeah, people are pretty good. Most of us. The inner spiritual life is neglected. Therefore, the need for the human revolution. Man's subconscious mind must be altered. As whence powerful impulses emerge beyond the control of rational judgment. Young. The subconscious mind must be altered because all sorts of things can come out of it, you know, beyond the control of rational judgment. So I think this is what we consider very much 